but they also do what we call service learning. You talk about service learning in India. Do you do service learning? No, not yet. Okay. This is where, for example, when I was 19, I was invited by a migrant farm worker's family to be their guest in the poorest neighborhood in one of our local cities. I was immersed in their life experience. I had grown up actually in a city, so I have been aware since a young age, but I became more aware of their perspective. We call this service learning. Living with a community, and I also worked with that community and the activists in that community to better their lives. And you know, my heart goes out to all the children who are growing up poor in the world today because I believe they are the most oppressed and they are the ones who deserve all this effort. So Joe Grimes, my colleague in computer engineering, believes that engineering students and technical students should receive service learning as well. And we have groups, you may be aware of them, Engineers Against Poverty, Engineers Without Borders, who are attempting to serve as Gandhi served. I also have taught students of engineering and technical students, and I don't think you would have imagined that when I was introduced. Because you would think most of my students are activists, intending to do NGO, nonprofit work. But no, at Berkeley, my students included technical students. Because they realize that they are playing roles with development around the world. And they need to be prepared to negotiate Engineers, and I'll talk about my father in a minute, and he is a great inspiration and support in my life. But he will tell you they're not always prepared to engage socially, interpersonally, and conflict can actually intimidate them. Perhaps some of you agree, conflict can intimidate most of us, especially if we are working in countries other than our own. Um, or on projects that are politically controversial, right? And so engineers are seeking training in conflict resolution skills to prepare themselves for this, to be able to be of service. I have also mediated with engineers. I am a professor who continues to be an activist and a practitioner. That is some of what I offer my students. I'm not just speaking abstractly. I am presenting real-world case studies of what they will need to prepare to do. And in working with mediators, uh, with engineers, excuse me, and scientists in the Department of the Interior. Now, if you know the U.S., you will know that that is the federal agency responsible for all the land in the United States. So all land disputes. Uh, the, all the indigenous relations, everything is covered by the Department of the Interior. I will say that they need this training as much as anyone. Uh, it's very important. Now my father, of course I'm proud of my father as you are proud of your family. Uh, but I have just met an Indian engineer who introduced himself just like I was about to introduce my father. He said he was very competitive and very good at sports. Well, my father excelled in five sports, so I can play that game too. Uh, but I'm not telling you that he was an excellent sportsman and a top student. I'm telling you he was a first generation graduate of a college because his mother immigrated from Norway and his father with German ancestry was a factory worker. So I can identify with some of the enthusiasm for technical training in India. It gave my father and his brothers an opportunity their family had never known. But what I'm most proud of with my father, and maybe it's the Norwegian influence, is instead of choosing you know, the money of oil and gas engineering, for example, my father chose service first. And he decided to become a fire protection engineer to serve people because he had seen so many lose their lives in fires. I think when we teach engineers Gandhi's example, ethics of conflict resolution, we are going to see more of this in the world today. I also want to briefly share my own journey. 
It's a very unusual one because most of my classmates in law school were there to make money, to have power. I have been an activist serving poor communities. I went to law school to have more power to advocate for women and children. But ironically, when I graduated from law school, I was not offered jobs doing public interest work. I was not offered Gandhian jobs. Two of the top elite law firms, uh, the ones all my classmates had aspired uh, to work for, offered me, these were international U.S. law firms, they offered me positions. And I was able to take one representing the schools, the public schools. So I was able to stay somewhat true to myself. But I'll tell you, uh, if you if you ever have the misfortune of needing to hire an American lawyer at an elite law firm, most of you, no matter how wealthy or affluent, and this is true in the States, cannot afford those legal costs. It is only our transnational corporations who have the money to pay for that legal representation. So you can imagine the moral, ethical dilemma I face. How could I justify spending my life doing this work? And I believe from my experience, fortunately I had the option of starting my mediation practice and was offered a job later teaching. I was able to find a way to make peace with myself. But I believe some of this ethical journey is a journey of searching within. I experienced that I was violent towards myself when I was working towards that law firm. And so each of us needs to make this ethical journey. Now Silicon Valley, I'm sure you're aware of Bill Gates and some of the famous people, are using their wealth to retire early and do social entrepreneurship, social service. That is one highly ethical example. You don't have to leave your career, you know, to follow in Gandhi's footsteps. Um, and I, I don't know your experience with social entrepreneurship, but I, but I would be interested in that ethical conversation. How can we make it more Gandhi-like? Okay, um, I guess most everyone is hearing me well enough. Good, because now I would like to spend some time. For those of you who weren't with me Tuesday, I want to introduce the basic model of how I teach peace building. Uh, I don't know if there are any political science faculty here today. Anyone? International relations. Yes. Yes. Normally, and I have taught in political science briefly at Berkeley too, normally you are constrained. You know, you are studying nation to nation, power and authority, weapons, <laughs> international systems, and this is all important and necessary in our world today. But peace building, like some of our other disciplines, or other interdisciplinary areas, has much more freedom. We can consider these lower levels as well, like Gandhi, both on an interpersonal level with our values, our consciousness, and in how we relate to each other. Are we treating everyone? as he treated everyone. So we can include that. You don't normally see that at the political level. Though I must say that I'm going to talk about President George Bush versus President Obama. The person at the table makes a great deal of difference even in politics. We also are able to study the important group level. You know, the religious group, the political group, what goes on within each group, and what happens between groups. So this is how I teach. And ethics is important at every level. I am going to pre present briefly some research-based finding uh, on the best and worst of decision-making under stress and crisis. I had some cynics in the room on Tuesday, and I'm hoping to persuade those of you who have some, you know, of the cynicism of 2012 that it's still important to talk about Gandhi ethics and conflict resolution at this point in time. Now this, at the international level, I'll talk about macro ethics and conflict resolution, and then I will talk about micro. 
the person to person, community to community, Gandhian like process. Have you all heard of study groupthink? It's one of the theories quite popular in the United States to represent the worst of decision making. And before I knew that a vice chancellor of the technical university would be here, I thought I'm going to talk about groupthink. It's a good distinction between President George Bush and President Barack Obama. Groupthink actually came out of studying engineering case studies. Excuse me. Real world examples of mistaken decisions that engineers made. And I really don't know if the engineers were responsible or if some bureaucrat or some, you know, authority silenced them. Um, but what happened, we had one of our shuttle disasters. We had engineers at the table designing that shuttle who knew how to correct the problems. But either because engineers tend to be uh, followers, they conform, they fit into the structure, that's how they're educated, uh, maybe they didn't feel comfortable speaking up. Or maybe they had a leader like our former President George Bush, who became renowned during his presidency for firing anybody who dared to disagree with him. He would accuse anyone who dissented with him of betraying him. You may not have heard this outside the States, but he had a horrible reputation for groupthink, and I think you know some of the results. We still have never discovered those weapons of mass destruction. I mean, he just, he had an arrogance in his inner circle. They were all, they almost felt like they were God. They could not do any wrong. And we suffered enormously because of groupthink. Now, it may sound like I'm encouraging the cynics in the room, but let me talk a little more. I've been reflecting since Tuesday on the, on the cost and the price of negativity and cynicism in my country. And you know, it, it, it uh, increases with privilege and affluence. You see more negativity and cynicism the more people have more than they need. It's true, uh, because you become spoiled. And because my country, there is a large percentage of people who don't even vote, uh, they expect their privilege will go on for forever without their participation. Um, we saw two elections, and I believe President George Bush only won one of those legally. But part of why he did win is because so many people were cynical and negative, and the result has been two horrific destructive wars. Now, I've had Indian people come to me more than once during the month I've been here and say, if you would reduce your military-industrial complex, it would hurt your whole economy. I'm here to say that our country did not have the money to wage these two wars in Iraq and the current one in Afghanistan. We are bankrupting our country by borrowing money. So we, as citizens, are not interested in continu continuing to fund this military-industrial complex. And if you are thinking that all American citizens support what's going on, I invite you to visit me, because I will introduce you to many who do not. But rather than fuel the cynicism in the room, I want to talk about what a difference it makes to elect the best of political leadership. And I have to say, even though Gandhi, you know, he focused on the village in India, he certainly acknowledged the powers that were present in the world that needed to be influenced and persuaded in order to serve communities. And I think he would be actively involved in talking about what's happening at the national and international level. President Barack Obama, in his approach, I'll tell you, if he had entered the room today, from what I hear, he would have greeted everyone equally. He would not be asking who is the most important and the least important in this room. And that is the example that I believe Gandhi gave to this world. And when he asked, what should we do, and I'm sorry, but I'm bringing up the strategy, uh, with bin Laden, 
it's not very Gandhi-like to be talking about Bin Laden, but it's a good example of applied ethics. It's not enough for him to have a yes or no, right or wrong discussion. The benefit and the cost of everything we do, and if his military leadership, and this has actually happened with Bin Laden, they say to him, I don't think you should pursue him. Yes, you should. If that's all they say, he goes to the outer circle. He says, that's not good enough. I want you to tell me every possible alternative. Doesn't that remind you of what you have studied with Gandhi? He was constantly strategizing, learning from success and failure to improve. And this makes all the difference. Now, I can't talk to you today, we don't have the time, about the co political complexities of withdrawing from Afghanistan as well as Iraq under his leadership. But if any of you want to talk personally, privately about this, please do. I'll take your whole afternoon. There's so much to say. Okay. And then, last but not least, I am attempting to the best of my ability to teach my students to be the best of our political leadership, not the worst. They are not the same. We cannot just be cynical. And one of the things that I must acknowledge, especially with the Vice Chancellor of a technical university, we live in an age where expert and authoritative expertise is critical. We cannot simply sit around and all express our opinions and come up with a collective opinion. In the United States, that collective opinion might be that there is no such thing as global warming. How ridiculous. We need the best of our scientists and experts uh, to inform us, but that doesn't mean that we give up the collective community approach. I teach the facilitative approach. The participatory people power inclusive approach. We must consider both. And so the question is not how can we return to the village in India. It's how do we in 2012 balance, have an optimal balance between contemporary expertise and facilitative participatory civil society. We need to have both. Now Tuesday I was, uh, had someone talk about decentralization quite passionately. And I am certainly not an expert on India. I'm not commenting about the government and power here. But in the United States, those who are arguing for decentralization actually are the wealthy elite who want to exploit the poorest of the poor. They want to avoid the constitutional protections of the center. So, you know, these are complex discussions. And the worst of crimes against humanity in the world today have happened in fallen nation states, where you don't have a strong, just enough center to protect the people. Of course, you also see unrestrained. And we must be asking, how do we develop international systems and civil society strong enough to check the worst of what they do, but not block the best of what they can do? And we were discussing citizen education last night. Part of what I'm trying to do in my curriculum is citizen education, and I'm teaching my students based on research that they must ask more questions. It's not enough to uh, just assume you know the, what's best or right, because our research shows that me mediocre and poor decisions result. And they must also learn to listen, and listen deeply, as Gandhi was able to listen. The conflict resolution I teach, not surprisingly, requires power balancing. I spoke in front of the Delhi High Court when I arrived in India. The most powerful industrialist walks into the room with the poorest of the poor in India, and they must be treated the same. That is the ethical requirement. We must somehow find a way at the macro level to have transparency 
with impartial oversight. And I must say, from what I am hearing, India has advanced in this direction quite potently in recent years, and I'm very happy to hear it. <coughs> Do I have time to go through micro? Is that okay? Okay. You have a bill that you've been fighting for for many years for this type of impartial oversight and transparency, and I actually work with the professional organization of these officers, these investigative officers, uh, all around the world. And I'll tell you, because I work with these people within the World Bank, the UN, the World Health Organization, battling power abuse and corruption is tough wherever it exists. And so they get together regularly to support each other and exchange strategies. Uh, I thought I have to have at least one Gandhi quote in my presentation today. And I'm sure you know this quote. Truth and love always prevail, and I happen to agree with him. And I want to give you some specific examples from around the world today. I was asked uh, by Norway, their Nansen network, to work with cross-ethnic dialogue in the Balkans during their war. So I met the peace builders of the Balkans during their war, all ethnic groups, all religious groups.